you are online. Hello, everybody. Okay, um, yes, so greetings everybody at the Water Pavilion, um, to anybody tuning in online um, on YouTube. My name is Robin Ward, I'm Program Manager here at um, the Stockholm International Water Institute. I'm tuning in from Stockholm and I specialize in uh, drinking water, sanitation and hygiene and the relationship with uh, climate change. So I would like to, yes, welcome everybody to this important last session on the uh, full Climate Resilient Wash Day um, at the Pavilion. Uh, this session is called uh, Realizing the Untapped Potential of Drinking Water, Sanitation and Hygiene in Climate Mitigation. And it's co-convened by uh, CIWI, UNICEF, uh, IMI, Integrated Water Management Institute, and WaterAid. So before we get started, just a bit of a uh, kind of background intro. I mean, I think it's fair to say that drinking water, sanitation and hygiene or, or wash as we like to call it in our sector, it, it may not be the first thing that you think about um, in terms of a climate mitigation solution. So through this session, we want to actually challenge that uh, perception that, that some people might have um, by taking a bit of a deep dive into the topic to actually try and clearly demonstrate that um, drinking water, sanitation and hygiene does in fact play a very important role in, in climate mitigation. And that through contributing to climate mitigation through uh, WASH, there are actually many additional uh, benefits, you know, from exploiting that opportunity. So um, in terms of the structure of the session today, one second. Um, yes, in terms of the structure today, um, to kick, kick off, we're gonna have a, a recap of actually uh, what happened on another dedicated wash and climate mitigation event that was actually held on day one of the water pavilion um, on the race to zero day. Uh, so that recap will be presented by uh, Sylvia Gaia from UNICEF who's at the pavilion. Um, then we're going to transition to a, a roundtable panel discussion with experts uh, both on from a centralized wastewater perspective and also a decentralized uh, sanitation perspective. And they're going to have a debate and a discussion about the role of uh, wash in climate mitigation. Um, so we have um, Professor Jacek Makina from the Gdansk University of Technology. We have uh, Dr. Sarah Dickin from Stockholm Environment, Environment Institute um, as our panelists. And then our moderator will be um, Dr. Dr. Gabor Santo um, from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency of the Dutch Ministry of um, Economic Affairs. Um, following that uh, panel discussion and debate, then we'll um, transition to the, what we're calling the case study uh, portion of the um, of the session. Uh, so there's going to be case studies presented from each of the co-convening organisations to actually try and showcase uh, what you know what does climate uh, mitigation in wash actually mean in practical terms, you know, in practical uh, examples from the field. Um, so and the intention of doing that is then to bring kind of theoretical, a bit more to, to light through practical examples. And through that, we intend to present a menu of different opportunities for uh, policy makers and also practitioners that can help them to understand how the WASH can contribute um, to them or to their uh, the mitigation targets within NDCs at country level. So without further ado, I would like to now um, hand over to Sylvia Gaia, UNICEF's Global Senior Advisor for Water and Climate and Water Pavilion Champion uh, back at the Water Pavilion to provide us with some opening, opening remarks and recap from uh, day one of the Pavilion. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. And uh, for those that were not with us uh, on the first day when this Water Pavilion for the first time started, we started the day one uh, showing and discussing the contribution of the broad water sector into mitigation. Um, and I wanted to just capture some of the things that were done because it was a very rich day with a lot of sessions, with a lot of data, particularly the data that was presented um, by the IPCC um, colleagues on the sixth assessment report that they have recently published. And data from experts is clear and they have come up with figures about what is the contribution um, that the water sector can bring to the mitigation agenda. Um, and in 
one of the data, and th there is a lot of data, and a lot more will be presented here today in the next uh, part of the of the discussion, is that between the three and the seven percent of the total greenhouse gas emissions come from water and wastewater services. So there is a, a, a huge contribution that we can do uh, just only looking at this. But I am sure that with um, the next experts will will uh, throw us uh, a lot of more inside data. Other things that were said during the the first day uh, here at the um, um, pavilion was the water uh, use efficiency is the best action that we can do in order to really contribute to the mitigation agenda. Um, it was also mentioned that we need a paradigm shift in water and uh, in water conservation, for which water demand management is one of the key interventions, as well as water reuse. Um, there was a, a lot of uh, references on the need of shifting towards climate resilient water and sanitation uh, programs, services, uh, and impact on communities, and of course um, also the cases on resource recovery from uh, biogas production. Um, another things that were also highlighted were um, on the water potential for mitigation that is really underestimated. So I hope that during this session here, we will be able to dig a little bit more on this, particularly for the water and sanitation sector. And also that mitigation cannot be done without uh, water because water is really the center of the energy generation. And we saw uh, also several good country examples across the day about how they are taking into the mitigation agenda through the water and sanitation sector. Finally, um, just mention on the on the first day there was some uh, wisdom also that was shown and we were coming up to the conclusion that we are getting close to get irreversible changes in water cycle uh, and in water resources because the water resources are going to be increasingly more scarce and more volatile. So we need action. We need to reduce the greenhouse uh, um, uh, gas emissions. And here today, uh, we are here to, to showcase how water and sanitation sector is going to uh, contribute to this. And they will present how uh, lots of actions on that regard is really going on. So thank you very much. And over to you again, Robin. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, so now we'll transition to the, the panel discussion part of this uh, session. So as mentioned before, we have some eminent experts with us, uh, particularly from the uh, uh, wastewater and decentralized sanitation perspective. Um, and they're really gonna dig deep into this, uh, yeah, what Sylvia was mentioning about us showing, you know, the contribution that WASH can really make to, to climate mitigation. Um, with us to moderate this discussion, uh, we're very pri privileged to have with us today uh, Dr. Gabor Santo. Um, Dr. Gabor is a senior advisor for the International Wash, for International Wash Initiatives at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, which is a department of the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs. Um, he has over 20 years of experience in the water, wastewater, and organic waste sectors. And since 20, uh, 2001, he's been involved uh, in practice oriented and academic research projects aimed at development of emission poor and economically sustainable waste treatment processes. So we're, we're very pleased to have you with us today, Dr. Gabor, and I would like to hand over to you to uh, introduce us to our panelists and proceed with the, the panel discussion. So over to you. Thank you, Dr. Gabor. Uh, hi, sorry. Okay, Dr. I apologize. I see that yes. I, I needed to uh, unmute. Uh, so again, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. It's an honor to be here. Um, I would like to greet everybody who are offering up the uh, Saturday afternoon or evening for this, um, I believe, exciting session. Um, with me today, Professor Jacek Makinja. He's an authority on climate relevance of wastewater technologies. He is active in the International Water Association, a member of the Strategic Committee and Secretary of the special, uh, Specialist Group on Nutrient Removal and Recovery. He's also a professor at uh, Gdansk University of Technology, and since 2014, uh, he's leading the university's Department of Sanitary Engineering. Today, um, he will be primarily uh, approaching uh, wash relevance in climate uh, uh, change mitigation from centralized, uh, from the centralized systems per perspective. Um, we also have with us Dr. Sarah Dickin. She's a team lead of sanitation and health at SEI, at the Stockholm Environment Institute. She holds a PhD in geography uh, from uh, McMaster University in Canada, and her uh, research focuses 
on the intersection of environment, development, and human health. She is also co lead um, of the research and learning constituency of the multi stakeholder partnership sanitation and water for all. Um, basically, these days we talk a lot about um, uh, climate adaptation in WASH, much less about uh, uh, the relevance of our sector or sectors uh, in climate mitigation. Um, I think it is a timely discussion uh, uh, that we execute today together with the case studies that will follow our uh, conversation. Um, look, just to offer some, some brief context, since the start of the, uh, for the, the early 19th century, when uh, um, the recognition came that wastewater uh, born uh, microorganisms may be uh, responsible for cholera, um, the whole sanitation sector has taken a, a huge leap and we are talking about the sanitary revolution uh, that may be uh, a key milestone in medical and human development since uh, 1840. Um, since then, we have covered a lot of challenges. We try to improve coverage of uh, water and sanitation services. Uh, we try to improve our efficiency and we try to make our services as inclusive uh, and as standardized as possible. It still doesn't mean that we can solve everything uh, according to one scheme, but we have centralized systems uh, throughout the developed world and in larger cities um, of emerging economies. Uh, we still have a very strong decentralized uh, um, uh, share in our, especially sanitation solutions, but also for water, and not only in a rural remote context, but also um, when we are talking about peri-urban and some special um, human habitat uh, um, uh, contexts. Basically, we have covered a lot of challenges, but we still have to cover a lot more. We have to manage new pollutants like microplastics and pharmaceuticals. Uh, we have to increase our uh, uh, coverage and improved services in the face of uh, urbanization and mitigation. And basically, we have to introduce circular methods and become much more um, climate relevant. So in the coming minutes, I will offer uh, a number of statements um, to the two panelists, uh, um, to Professor Makania and uh, Dr. Dickin, and I'm curious um, of their uh, experiences that they are prepared to share with us. So without much further ado, uh, statement one. So our first statement, energy demand and consumption and uh, process-related emissions we're going to talk about. A key climatic relevance in the current wastewater and sanitation management relates to its rather significant energy consumption, which presents a major opportunity for climate mitigation. Professor Makania, which evidence uh, do we have to support this statement, please? Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending where you are. Thank you, Dr. Shanto, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, I will be talking about the centralized uh, sanitation systems. And maybe it's worth of mentioning at the beginning that the modern sanitation systems were actually born in the UK. And the modern means uh, pipe water and flushed sewer. And for the last 100 years, those systems have been operated successfully in according to the linear model, which assumes uh, that uh, water is first uh, withdrawn and treated and distributed, and then the wastewater is uh, collected, treated, and discharged to a receiving body. Unfortunately, from today's perspective, this is not a sustainable solution due to inefficient use of resources as well as high energy demand. And for, for this last uh, issue, high energy demand, I would like to give you a picture, a very recent example from the US, that energy consumption in water treatment and wastewater treatment facilities emits uh, the same amount of carbon dioxide as 9 million uh, cars each year. Uh, and other data shows that water and wastewater management is responsible for roughly 4% of the total electricity cons consumption worldwide. And this share will be increasing 
in the nearest future. Uh, the forecast is even more than 50% in the next 20 years. And this is because of expansion of the sanitation systems in the developing countries, as well as implementation of new treatment technologies for above water production, for example, desalination and removal of specific pollutants from wastewater. Uh, it should be uh, emphasized that uh, energy consumption refers to so-called indirect uh, greenhouse gas emissions, whereas in wastewater systems, especially wastewater treatment plants, the direct uh, greenhouse gas emissions dominate. And both types of emissions are the components of a carbon footprint. And maybe surprisingly, but nitrous oxide is of special interest in wastewater treatment plants because of its high emissions in biological wastewater treatment processes. Uh, by the way, this is a, a very interesting research issue. And also because of high global warming potential. And there are some case studies showing that uh, carbon dioxide, uh, excuse me, nitrous oxide emissions uh, contribute to more than 50% to the total car carbon footprint of wastewater treatment plants. This is my answer to your first question. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor. How far are we to manage those, uh, those emissions? Could you reflect uh, uh, on uh, basically what are the key areas that, that we need to, to strengthen our emission control? Uh, yes, so at this moment we are uh, relying on primarily on empirical emission factors, which are pretty much uncertain, and also theoretical models, which have not been validated. So, so this is, uh, you know, this as for the emissions from wastewater treatment plants, but uh, concerning the places where we should uh, focus on, this is the biological stage of wastewater treatment plants, which emits. Uh, 90% of nitrous oxide. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Sarah Dickin, which evidence do we have to support this statement, particularly in rural context? So the, the energy consumption that we have in the sector, in, this, in the subsector, and that it presents a major opportunity for climate change impact mitigation. Um, so in terms of decentralized systems, which are uh, common in rural, but also urban and peri-urban areas, um, first of all, I think it's important to think about these systems because they have been a bit overlooked compared to centralized systems in the discussion, in this particular discussion about um, emissions. Um, but they're often the first rung of sanitation that a household might get on. So moving from no sanitation to sanitation access, um, this might be gaining access to a pit latrine, for example. Um, but I first want to put this into a bit of context. So there was one study that found that pit latrines emit about 1% of global anthropogenic uh, methane emissions per year. So it is relatively small, but at the same time, uh, we there are still billions of people without access to safely managed systems. So we can expect um, these emissions of methane to increase. Um, so in terms of decentralized systems where pit emptying is done, uh, there is some energy that's used uh, for transportation of sludge uh, for treatment, as well as the treatment processes themselves. Um, and as we just heard, these are the indirect emissions compared to the uh, direct emissions from uh, the decomposition of the organic uh, matter itself. So the question then is, um, are these, uh, these this energy consumption a significant source of emissions, or should we be looking at other points in the sanitation chain in the system? Um, you mentioned the, an important. Sorry, you, uh, yeah. you mentioned an important point that that basically we already uh, um, lose a lot of uh, um, methane at uh, the latrine level, at the toilet toilet level. Um, basically, considering the full sanitation chain, and we are still in the decentralized mm -hmm. uh, uh, segment of uh, the sanitation sector. What would be the other priority points in the chain to best target uh, for uh, mitigation opportunities, in your opinion? 
Yeah, so this is a bit difficult to answer because so far there has been limited research looking at this and also trying to quantify um, emissions from decentralized systems, comparing between different types of sanitation options and also comparing it to uh, what kind of emissions there are when you discharge waste untreated. Uh, but I can cite one example of some research that's being done at Leeds University. Um, and they're looking at on-site systems in Uganda. And so far their research has found that actually the uh, emissions related to transport, so where you're having this um, energy consumption for trucking sludge around, um, are actually much smaller than uh, the direct emissions from the on-site systems themselves. So from compared to the emissions from the systems um, being released in terms of large uh, emissions of methane as well as nitrous oxide, um, this is actually much more important than the energy and the emissions being consumed in the transportation process. Um, so then the priority points in the sanitation chain would then be looking at where um, there's anaerobic storage of fecal sludge happening. This would be probably the most important point, but I'll just finish by saying that we do need more studies on this to better understand it. Um, like we just heard as well on better emissions data, um, we have very coarse models for this. Um, as well as better understanding of different decomposition mechanisms across different types of uh, on-site systems. So we do need to get a, a, a gain a better understanding of this to understand which point in the chain is, is going to be most effective to intervene, but we, we do have some initial understanding. Thank you very, very much for that. So basically, if I understand it uh, right, then we have to look at the full sanitation chain because the weakest link in the sanitation chain will uh, likely emit uh, the most and in these central cases, when you're talking about pit latrine type of solutions at the start of the chain, then basically that is already a great uh, um, emitting uh, phase or step in the chain. Thank you very much for that. So I'm coming to our second statement uh, about energy efficiency in our processes. Despite energy consumption in uh, water and wastewater management, energy and heat generation opportunities from wastewater uh, appear larger in scale than the energy demand that is needed for their uh, proper operations. Uh, energy efficiency measures, use of renewable energies like solar, in some cases wind uh, power, um, maybe reducing demand and losses, res uh, increase resource recovery, and contribute to an energy generation with positive mitigation results. So it's a long statement. Um, allow me to start with uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Dicking this time. Um, uh, sorry, I apologize. Uh, again, with uh, Professor Makinia. Um, uh, Professor Makenia, in some of your publications, you have mentioned a concept of energy neutrality in uh, wastewater treatment and wastewater treatment plants. Um, would you define this concept to us and uh, uh, would you explain what uh, you imply by it in uh, not only in academia, but also in practice? Thank you. Professor McKinney? Yes, yes, thank you for, for this question. Sorry for a short delay. Uh, yes, thank you for this question. And uh, the energy neutrality or, or uh, self sufficiency is the situation when, when energy consumption is balanced by energy production in wastewater treatment plants. And for example, uh, several energy neutral concepts were demonstrated in full scale wastewater treatment plants under a European Union Horizon 2020 uh, 20 project called Power Step. And actually, there are several uh, steps, several uh, ways to improve the energy balance in wastewater treatment plants, including uh, better uh, efficiency of devices, energy devices, or applying low demand processes. But uh, the plants could truly be energy neutral provided that energy recovery from wastewater is implemented, which is actu actually in line with the concept of circular economy. Uh, it should be emphasized that raw wastewater contains quite a lot of uh, energy. There are three types of energy. This is uh, chemical energy, thermal energy and hydro uh, energy. And especially chemical energy has the great, greatest potential for recovery uh, when applying uh, anaerobic digestion and uh, produce uh, biogas. Unfortunately, only a minor portion of, of this influent energy, maybe several percent, could actually be used to generate electricity 
And uh, this covers up to roughly 50% of the energy needs in wastewater treatment plants applying uh, anaerobic digestion. So uh, to obtain the full energy neutrality, the amount of biogas produced should be increased significantly. And there are several ways to do this. For example, increasing carbon redirection from the treatment line to anaerobic digestion or applying some uh, sludge pretreatment methods or a co-digestion of external substrates such as waste products from industry or agriculture. So in addition to the energy balance uh, could be removed by on-site uh, applications of, of renewable energy sources, but in general, we, we should be care about uh, those additional actions because they could uh, contribute to indire either indirect or, or, or direct greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. So basically, if I understand it right, that you, that you, uh, then you claim that energy neutrality is not only an unattainable vision, but this is something that can be technically uh, uh, managed in the coming years um, based on the energy surplus that you have in your uh, raw wastewater or fecal sludges. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I, I show this example from uh, this European project, but uh, personal, I know a couple of plants in Poland that uh, are uh, energy neutral. So it means that they produce uh, at least the same amount of energy on site that they consume. Thank you very much again. Um, Dr. Sarah Dickin, uh, does the concept of energy neutrality uh, uh, apply and translate to decentralized context? And if yes, how, please? Um, yes, yeah, so I, I don't think that the concept of energy neutrality translates that well to decentralized contexts and particularly rural areas, for example, um, partly because if we're thinking about these systems being used in low and middle income countries, I don't think that that should be the, the priority necessarily, but I think we can think about potential um, opportunities for co-benefits where we can reduce um, emissions, but we can also um, pursue and uh, resource recovery opportunities. So to obtain energy um, from these waste products. And the, so energy in the form of biogas, for example, or fuel briquettes. And there are a number of examples of these types of processes, um, obtaining energy from decentralized systems. Uh, one example um, is Sanivation, which is a social enterprise in Kenya. They use their own container-based sanitation system, uh, which they collect regularly. And then from the uh, collected waste, they produce fuel briquettes, um, and these can be used as alternative fuel sources um, instead of wood or charcoal. Um, and these fuel sources um, last longer than those than, than wood or charcoal, for example, but they also emit um, fewer chemicals, which are dangerous for human health. Another example of this is in Haiti, where uh, researchers have looked at um, off-site composting of human excreta, and they found that this actually has um, lower um, greenhouse gas emissions compared to um, traditional methods for uh, treatment and disposal of waste from pit latrines. Um, so it has lower emissions, but it also um, can lead to production of a fertilizer product, so it can be um, recovered and used as fertilizer in agriculture. So there are a number of examples. Yep. Please, please go on, please continue. Okay, um, so I just wanted to highlight that there are a number of examples in um, low middle income countries where we can have co-benefits where we um, are uh, obtaining energy as well as reducing emissions. Um, I just wanted to mention one more point, uh, more about the, the case of water. We've been talking mostly about uh, sanitation, but in the case of water, um, regions where you have a less optimal um, electric grid, peri-urban or rural areas, you might actually see some kind of energy transition when it comes to uh, wash solutions. So here, um, solar energy has been used in a number of contexts for uh, water pumping for a wide number of uses, and this can actually end up over longer term being cheaper, um, more reliable over a longer period and require less maintenance. Um, so I think yeah, it applies in a number of contexts in the wash sector. Thank you very much for that. I'm curious, uh, from your own experience, do you see a, a steady growth of anaerobic digestion or those container-based combined integrated uh, treatment systems uh, being upscaled? I mean, not one design, but just in general, that, uh, that uh, utilization of energy from uh, 
for example, fecal sludge or waste, waste waters. Uh, do you see a steady growth? Are they still just a niche uh, uh, solution? I think uh, there there is some steady growth, but I don't think it, it's far from being the mainstream. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think we still need to actually demonstrate the benefits of these types of options um, and have some some innovative uh, financing mechanisms as well. Um, so it's something where there's a lot of potential, but I, it's very, very far from um, a mainstream approach. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Um, our third statement, uh, it's about technologies and challenges. Uh, perhaps the main focus of Russian emerging economies is the reduction of untreated or only partially treated wastewaters and fecal sludges. The arising emissions and losses are important contributors to climate change. Um, the extension of wastewater collection and treatment systems, including decentralized solutions and adoption of resource recovery and reuse solutions is not only a challenge, but it may also be an opportunity to efficiently reform our conventional systems, our dominant sanitation systems, into sustainable and climate-proof sectors. Um, so again, starting with uh, Professor Mahinha, what key strategies uh, uh, can you identify for this, uh, for this transition in our sanitation sector? Thank you for this question. Uh, yes, uh, so with respect to energy efficiency as a general solution, uh, I think that we uh, should consider the current linear model should be changed, should we switch to a circular one by closing the water loop uh, to recover and reuse resources in wastewater, not only energy, as I mentioned, but also water and nutrients. So these are three uh, most important resources to be recovered from wastewater. And there are also interactions uh, through this loop with agriculture and industry but still wastewater treatment plants are the critical components of this closed loop. And there is a new paradigm of wastewater treatment actually, assuming uh, switching the traditional wastewater treatment plants to what is called water resource recovery facilities. Uh, with respect to mitigation of the direct greenhouse gas emission in the wastewater treatment plants, in, in principle, there are three possible approaches. Uh, the first one, uh, capturing and treatment of gaseous streams containing the greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gases. Maybe this is not a feasible solution due to high uh, cost of high investment costs, but there are already some plants that are fully covered. So this is, uh, this is the first option. Uh, the second solution may be most economical for existing plants, and this is minimi minimization through the optimization of operational conditions. And this especially refers to a ration, which is the largest uh, energy consumer in wastewater treatment plants. And the third one is prevention by applying new configurations and processes. And this, this might be recommended for future plants. And this comprise, for example, maximizing the anaerobic pathway of organic removal or uh, replacing uh, conventional nitrification, denitrification for, for nitrogen removal by anamox-based systems. Anamox stands for uh, anaerobic ammonia oxidation, which is a process yeah. uh, le much less demanding than, uh, uh, than uh, nitrification and denitrification. But we need to remember that mitigation strategies are not always win-to-win -win solutions, but they are rather optimization problems and uh, where we have trades off between increased and decreased uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so. Uh, Let's take aeration as an example. So decreased aeration results in lower energy consumption, but on the other hand, it creates favorable conditions for N2O production and also a threat for increased N2O emissions. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, Dr. Dickin, do we have the right solutions for uh, both peri-urban and rural uh, contexts in decentralized uh, decentralized sanitation? or perhaps water abstraction and treatment. How do you see that? 
Um, so in terms of the best solutions, I think, first of all, there, there is no one best solution for any of these situations. Um, but I think it's important to start thinking about um, climate criteria, for example, when we're looking at uh, together with other criteria when we're, we're selecting sanitation options. Um, so in the case of decentralized systems like pit latrines or septic tanks, um, the solutions themselves might be okay, but we need to think more about actually how they're being managed um, to reduce emissions. This is actually where some of the problems begin. So um, particularly um, in ana anaerobic conditions, waterlogged conditions, um, management um, is much more important. Um, and so this also highlights the importance of contact specific solutions. So if you have a, an area with a dry climate, this is going to be less of a challenge than an area with a lot of um, flooding where you have very waterlogged conditions that contribute to anaerobic conditions more often. So then in that particular context, you will need to think much more about um, how you build your systems, how you manage them. Um, but for decentralized systems, this is also an opportunity because we can be a little bit more innovative. There are a number of different options. Uh, we can go beyond um, the sort of business as usual approaches. Um, so we can better tailor solutions to a particular context, which means then we can think about um, the types of management systems that we need and try to adapt it um, to fit a particular uh, solution that's needed in that context. Basically, uh, the decentralized solutions, partly because they are so diverse and partly because they have an increased, perhaps because they have an increased uh, uh, view and regarding of their, of their specific context, may bring forth some, forth some uh, innovations that can uh, actually cut some curves and, uh, and come up ahead in some cases. Uh, is that, uh, do I understand it properly? Yeah, so I think that there's, there's more potential for innovation and then in order to try and um, compare different options, then we should have some kind of uh, introduce new criteria related to climate that we haven't really had before, where, you know, if all things are equal in terms of, um, for example, health risks and so on, then, then we can think about, okay, in this particular context, what about um, the importance of climate and how can we then, um, how can that inform our decision making? Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm coming to the fourth and last statement of our, uh, of our discussion. And uh, that couples very strongly to, uh, to what you both have said uh, in this last statement. We basically need a transition. We have to view our, uh, our uh, uh, water and wastewater treatment designs, also in case of decentralized solutions. And um, we have to, to transit them towards a more uh, climate relevant uh, uh, treatment, basically domain or field. For that, perhaps, above everything, we need some financing. So my last statement is related to uh, um, improving or relating to climate financing and, and uh, similar uh, relevant financing options. So the statement sounds as follows. The water sector is poorly represented in the climate policy debate, also receives a limited share of uh, climate related finance and less finance for mitigation than in case of uh, uh, the field of adaptation. It is estimated that climate financing directed at uh, ensuring basic access to water and sanitation and hygiene is only a tenth of climate finance for water-related projects, accounting to, uh, for about 0.3% of the total global uh, climate finance funding available. More and better efforts uh, are needed in the development of the demonstrated climate rationale for the whole of the wash sector. If the direct impact of climate change on wash ser services or the lack of them is not properly demonstrated, then uh, it is likely that climate financing options remain limited. The complexity of climate change also may imply that uh, statements that we make from the sector in climate proposals should require uh, proper argumentation, perhaps with solid academic or action research data. Uh, Professor, how do you see that? And what are the main uh, areas of limitation that, that uh, uh, we need to improve to properly argumentate for, uh, uh, for changes and to reach out to climate financing and other type of uh, uh, um, green funding or social impact investor type of financing. Yes, thank you. I come from the academia, so I will be talking about the data, the lack of data actually, but we have uh, in uh, the centralized sanitation system, we have two situations, two different situations. One refers to the energy consumption and the data on energy consumption are pretty much available and well documented. 
Uh, on the other hand, the data and knowledge on the direct greenhouse gas emissions from sanitation systems at the global level are still limited. And as I already mentioned, we need to rely on empirical emissions factors or theoretic, th theoretical models, which are still highly uncertain. Uh, one example, uh, last year, two, report, two important reports uh, were released uh, on greenhouse gas inventories in the United States and European Union. And those uh, two documents uh, reveal differences in the levels, in the current levels and uh, trends over the last 30 years for N2O and methane emissions from wastewater treatment sector. For example, uh, N2O emissions in the United States were growing, and this was attributed to the growing population and increased uh, protein consumption. Whereas in the European Union, the trend was decreasing and it was attributed to the improved wastewater treatment. So to reduce the uncertainty and find out about uh, the actual greenhouse gas emissions from wastewater treatment plants, uh, a uh, especially more standardized approach to carbon footprint assessment uh, studies would be needed. And I know from my experience that uh, setting uh, measurements in wastewater treatment plants is not easy. Uh, it should be also uh, emphasized that mitigation strategies are at the end of the decision making process, starting from collecting the data, then analyzing and uh, understanding the process, then uh, developing decision support tools such, uh, such as mathematical models, and then at the end proposing and uh, implementing this uh, mitigation strategies. Thank you very much. Um, um, Dr. Dickin, what is needed to increase the relevance of uh, decentralized Washington climate finance proposals? How do you see this uh, uh, need for better financing and better approaching finances, uh, available funding, so. Um, yeah, so I think the first challenge is actually awareness of the linkages between sanitation and climate. Um, so regardless of the financing model, um, we need to increase knowledge of this among uh, WASH implementers, um, countries, as well as funding organizations, because there has been a, a focus on much more immediate issues compared to long term, uh, cli the climate perspective over the long term. Um, and we can see an example of this. Actually, we looked at inclusion of sanitation in the NDCs. So first of all, we looked at um, uh, SDG 6. So how many NDCs were relevant to SDG 6? And we found this was about 9%. Uh, of NDC sort of concrete activities. Um, but then we looked closer at this. So of those related to SDG 6, only 2% actually related to sanitation and 3% related to wastewater. Uh, so we can see from this that um, there's really no inclusion of sanitation in the NDC. So I think that this highlights the point that among uh, sanitation as well as climate stakeholders, there's limited knowledge of the importance of these issues. Um, so I think um, the first step before um, improving access to climate finance or obtaining climate finance is increasing knowledge of these linkages. Um, we also found that there was very few projects um, in the Green Climate Fund uh, project proposals that included sanitation. Uh, so similarly, we think that this reflects um, a lack of awareness of the importance of these issues. Um, so the main takeaway is that we need to um, improve awareness and hopefully events like this will, will, will serve to do that as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dickin. So basically after four statements and uh, um, just finishing our discussion, I would like to offer a very brief recap before we move over to the uh, case studies. Um, so we have heard that, that uh, basically in, in quite some detail that we are not only uh, trying to save the planet by properly and professionally treating different waters and uh, wastewaters, we are also contributing to the climate change itself and unfortunately in a significant way. Um, basically, our panelists have ensured us that uh, moving towards uh, more climate relevant designing would be appropriate. Uh, we also learned that we have to look, in, especially in case of sanitation, already at the input material in centralized system, systems that is uh, of a somewhat lesser challenge. We have basically from the, 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 the phase of uh, uh, toilet 
and um, uh, fecal sludge and wastewater collection. Everything is standardized and uh, more or less properly co uh, contained. This is a much bigger challenge. This seems a much bigger challenge in case of these central systems. We also heard uh, what ways we can uh, make our uh, uh, energy production and consumption more efficient and perhaps even reach neutrality, at least in case of uh, centralized uh, sanitation. We also heard that uh, decentral so solutions may offer some uh, surprising solutions in the form of modern combined, sometimes uh, container-based solutions, uh, but there's also uh, some growth, at least, in the use of anaerobic digestion. We have talked about technologies and challenges, and we learned that capturing and treating of gases, uh, albeit it may be the, the most direct way of uh, reducing emissions because of the relatively high costs, this may not be the most feasible solution. Um, and we heard uh, Professor Makinia um, to mention the alternatives available here. Um, in case of decentralized sanitations, uh, we heard that uh, the diversity of solutions actually can trigger an increased level of uh, innovations. Finally, when we come to reaching out for financing options, climate financing options uh, in particular, we have two major challenges. One is to argumentate our proposal with uh, solid data. Part of it can come from academia, action research, even from practice if uh, uh, the methods are uh, proper to identify and quantify them. And we have heard that in uh, decentral sanitation, awareness can already bring us uh, a long way. So I thank you very much for your attention in this uh, discussion. And I would like to thank the two panelists, um, Dr. Sara and Dr. Jacek, uh, for the contributions and forthcoming answers. Uh, thank you very much. Um, back to you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gabor, and I would like to echo a huge thanks to um, yourself and the, both of the panelists for this fascinating uh, discussion. Um, it's really eye-opening, and um, yes, yeah, so just once again, thank you very much. We will um, now we'll transition to the, the case study segment of this session. Um, so as you can see on the slide, um, we've worked with the, the co-conveners to try and select some key thematic areas or topics where um, we've already heard that, you know, WASH can really contribute to climate mitigation. And we intend that these case studies can present this kind of menu of opportunities for, for policy and practitioners, policy makers and practitioners alike um, that, you know, tangibly contribute to the uh, mitigation uh, commitments in the NDCs. So yeah, going through one by one, we, I mean, yeah, from the first side, we'll have a case study on increasing the energy efficiency of water supply led by UNICEF. Then we'll have uh, one focusing more on um, how, you know, unsafe sanitation and open defecation is, is essentially a bit of a missed opportunity for uh, mitigation. Um, and that, you know, scaling up san safely to manage sanitation can be a real opportunity. Then we'll move to, that's with WaterAid, then we'll move to uh, EMI. Uh, who will talk about the circular economy to support the sanitation value chains whilst mitigating and adapting to climate change. And finally, we'll end with UNICEF, who will talk or show a video more on um, the use of renewable energies in, in water supply production and distribution. So uh, now I would like to hand back over to Sylvia at the pavilion to introduce the first case study, please. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Robin. And um, now we are going to show two examples in a video. Uh, the first example is about Ukraine to demonstrate the range, uh, the range of opportunities uh, to improve efficiency across the water network uh, using very advanced technologies and modelings to see where the pressure along the network could be reduced, as well as identifying areas of leakage. The second part of the video is the example of Iraq that showcases the potential of transitioning from a diesel uh, powered system to a solar powered system, which improves the availability of safe water to the most vulnerable communities. And in Iraq, 
this also goes together with a campaign that is done uh, households um, door to door in the households through the youth volunteers in order to really um, increase the, the behavior in terms of water conservation. And we, we, we hope that with these two examples we can showcase uh, this first uh, area on how the efficiency and the reduction of the amount of uh, fuel fossil um, is uh, used can really contribute to mitigation. So um, the video comes now, thank you. In Ukraine, major achievements in water and energy efficiency have been made through hydraulic modeling of the water network and a review of the asset management system. This approach has helped to identify sections of the water network that were leaking. When the leaking sections are identified, they are replaced. The replacement of these sections reduces the greenhouse emissions of the water network and the associated energy and operational costs. Importantly, replacement of the leaking section also reduces the amount of water that needs to be abstracted and reduces the risk of contamination along damaged sections of the network, which contributes to a safer and sustainable water service. In Iraq, increasingly high temperatures and growing demand for power put intense pressure on the power grid, particularly during the periods of peak demand during the summer months. This can cause severe service interruptions, including disruptions to the distribution of water and the treatment of wastewater. Due to the unreliability of many of these services, particularly in rural areas, many systems rely on backup generators, leading to an increase in greenhouse emissions. By transitioning to solar power for water systems, the emissions are reduced, and this also leads to a more consistent and predictable water service. This is particularly important during periods of extreme heat, ensuring that water services can be sustained to the most vulnerable. The sunlight was not there. Thank you to um, our UNICEF colleagues for showing the, the first video there um, with concrete examples uh, from Ukraine, Ukraine and Jordan. Um, so yes, moving on to our second um, case study section, I would like to invite uh, Arta Matavelli from uh, Waterway to join us on the screen. Arta, if you, if you could unmute and, and show your video, please. Ah, fantastic. Thank you very much, Arta. Uh, great to have you with us. Um, so Arta Matavelli is a policy and governance manager from uh, WaterAid Mozambique, um, and he's going to talk about the this, this situation in, in uh, Mozambique now. Um, so over to you, Arta, we'll put the slides for you and just let us know when to transition, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Greetings to everyone. I'll talk about uh, sanitation and climate change in Mozambique. Please, next slide. So in this slide, uh, I'll show the, the challenge that the country has in its position. Geographically, we are in southern part of Africa. The country has a long coast, about 3,000 kilometers, and is prone to cyclones. In the last 40 years, the country had, was hit by 21 cyclones, uh, 20 floods, and 21 drought. So the country is prone to climate change. In a, in a, a contest of uh, 46% of population living below poverty line and 60% of population live in coastal areas, 68% in rural areas. The coverage of sanitation is only about uh, 30%, uh, meaning that we, are, we have about 7% of population without proper or safe sanitation. Next slide, please. 
So when we talk about climate change in Mozambique, and the majority of population, for majority of population, uh, climate change means lack of rain, lots of rain, destructive winds, um, and this brings these consequences, destruction of latrines, and increasing of number of people, um, practicing open defecation, and spread of sewage into surface and groundwater, endangering public health destroy farm production. This situation um, lead to, uh, to the need of uh, raising awareness both to the citizens and the decision makers because we need to make people be aware what is happening and how the people can adapt to live in this uh, context of climate change and the decision makers has to understand and start to plan, to think, to strategize how to help the population uh, to live in the context of climate change. If we see the, the number of people living in coastal area and in rural area where it's difficult to, to have um, safe um, sanitation service, uh, is a big challenge to, for the citizens to build by themselves the, the, the sanitation system. Next slide, please. So the challenges I started to mention, uh, most of Mozambique lives in the rural and coastal area, where it's difficult to build the latrine, is where the climate change impact um, hits, and when where the, the, the poverty is, um, is and um, uh, where the technologies for, for safe sanitation are not uh, available. And uh, rural household families in the, the current policy, they have to build by themselves. There is no subsidy for sanitation making things hard when we have people living in rural area where the soils are not stable, where the, the technology are not available. So the high level of urban defecation become increasingly high. Mozambique is one of the, the country with high level of open defecation. So there is a challenge and uh, the urgent need is to consider sanitation, waste management, treatment, technologies and improving pumping efficiencies, use of a renewable source of energy for poor communities to, have, uh, to offer potential for reducing emissions. The, this is the central challenge and the, the, need, the, the urgent need that we, we have to find the right technologies for poor people and uh, context of uh, instable soils and uh, um, high level of poverty. The next slide. So we, 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 we have policies uh, in country, um, policies uh, dealing to mitigation. Uh, Mozambique is committed to reduce uh, greenhouse gas effects. Um, but it's not clear how this process is planned, how is uh, monitored, how the, the indicators are set, and how the, the budget is defined. One particular uh, challenge has to do with access to the greenhouse funds, for instance, for sanitation in countries like Mozambique. Becomes, it, it is uh, really a, a challenge. This is an opportunity to review or to see how the, the available funds uh, globally can be channeled to countries like, uh, like uh, Mozambique. Uh, the water policy also, the country water policy also mentions sanitation as an essential tool, as essential tool for preventing waterborne disease cholera, malaria, diarrhea, and improving the quality of life and environment policy. 
but it's not clear how this process is planned, how is monitored, and how is budgeted. Sanitation is the the subsector without uh, money to implement the uh, projects in general terms. I can say that. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Arthur. So yeah, I mean it's really it's very worrying now to see you know the climate change, the impacts of climate change are really. You know, potentially having a, a role in increasing granite, uh, greenhouse gas emissions through sanitation, through you know disrupting the sanitation cycle. So it's clear that there is an urgent need for you know ensuring more resilient and safely managed sanitation solutions, which can also then you know be a, a mitigation climate mitigation contribution. So I think it's nice. It highlights very much you know that adaptation and mitigation, of course, very much come come hand in hand. And I'm sure Mozambique is not alone in uh, in, uh, in this, facing this this challenge. So, um, yeah, clearly much more needs to be done to invest in you know more safely managed sanitation and help people to you know progress up that uh, sanitation service ladder. So thank you very much, Arthur. Um, now I would like to um, invite our next case study speaker from uh, Integrated Water Management Institute. Um, International Water Management Institute, sorry, um, Dr. Josiane uh, Nikimi. Sorry if I'm saying the name wrong. Um, I would like you to join on the uh, screen for us, if you could, to say hello before you put up the slides. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Josiane Ikema. I'm a researcher at the International Water Management Institute. Um, I am currently the lead for the Circular Economy and Water Pollution Research Group, and we have activities around how we can promote sustainable and inclusive growth. Uh, currently, you know, take into account issues such as urbanization, agricultural in intensification, but also, of course, climate change. So I'm happy to be here with you today. Yes, so uh, yeah, I want to talk to you about um, the circular economy in particular and how we can use circular economy to address a number of issues that we see happening in the sanitation sector. Um, of course, my presentation today comes after a number of discussions that have taken place uh, earlier and a number of points that I'm going to make today, uh, especially with some data that I will share, I will inform and will support some of the statements that were made earlier by our panelists. So let's go on to the next slide. And beginning from this, so you see in this this map that shows, uh, you know, below your screen, you see the coverage, uh, the sanitation coverage all over the world. And the number that is within the, the round circle is not very important for us today, actually presents the number of people that are covered using uh, on-site sanitation systems. But the point I want to make is that, you know, the widest, the largest number of people actually is served sanitation-wide using either sewers, which are considered in many cases as the conventional approach, or using on-site sanitation systems, which consist of septic tanks or pit latrines, and you know, especially in the developing world, uh, are one of the main um, sanitation solution that is being used. So how does it work? You have uh, the, the sanitation service chain that is presented on your, at the top of your screen. So from the user interface, which is within your household, the waste is going to go either to a sewer network, and there you have wastewater that is being produced. It has to be treated, and after the treatment, most of the time what happens is the disposal. Uh, but then there is also opportunity for hand use, and I'll be talking elaborately about that. The other alternative is, you know, in areas where the sewer network is not functional, is not existing, Extent, then we have to go for on-site containment uh, of the waste. And then those sites, those uh, systems have to be emptied from time to time. And the waste has to be transported to a treatment facility. And 
you know, within those sites, treat it before it can be disposed or eventually reused. So there are a number of mitigation approaches that can be considered along the service chain, uh, especially when it comes to optimizing the transportation and some of the cases that were presented before, uh, optimizing the networks to make sure that we really minimize energy consumption. Uh, these are possible solutions, but I will focus my presentation today towards the end of the chain and look at ways we can, you know, reuse the resources uh, and then at the same time not only address mitigation but also adaptation to climate change. Next. So um, here I present some data you know on the the left hand side, you see the wastewater production, and then on the right, some data concerning the fecal sludge. So, globally, uh, worldwide, the average is 95 cubic meter per capita per year of wastewater that is being generated per capita per person. So, in North America, we have the highest number, and then in South, uh, Southern Africa, we have the lowest number due to challenges often related to access to water. Uh, with regards to fecal sludge, the volumes that are produced by capita are much less. And the reason is that there is a lot of infiltration through um, the sanitation systems that occurs. And that means that, you know, especially in the developing world, we have much less in volume that is generated below 0 0.3 cubic meter per capita and per year. And the main message I'll make to you for you today is that really wastewater and fecal sludge, when they are properly managed, when they are properly processed and we are able to recover the resources out of these materials, we are able to really very significantly contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. Next. So starting with the wastewater, uh, this graph shows, like this drawing shows the ladder of value proposition. So at very minimum, uh, when we have wastewater, for instance, we need to treat it because we know it contains pathogens, contains contaminants for the environment. So the very minimum that has to be done is that that wastewater has to be treated. And this is actually what many people, many countries do. They treat the wastewater, but it stops there. And what we are saying is that we should be able to go beyond beyond the basic treatment and introduce also some productive use of that wastewater. So wastewater can be treated and reused in irrigation. Uh, we can recover nutrients out of it. It can be recovered uh, for industrial use. It can be recovered even for potable water in some countries. There are some cases of that. Um, so this is on the one hand. So there you can see that the wastewater that is being treated, the reuse aspect really replaces fresh water from abstract, being abstracted. And that is very important, especially in urban and very urban areas where there is some scarcity for weight for water due to the urban, you know, the, the sizes of the urban, um, the urban cities. The other option which really talks to the mitigation is where we can recover the energy and sometimes even benefit from some carbon credits for during the treatment. So we can recover the energy, we can also produce some animal feed, you know, some algae, uh, different productive use can produce biodiesel from there. Uh, a lot of applications really can be, uh, can be uh, introduced during the treatment of the wastewater. The thing is, wastewater treatment is well understood and well known. Uh, we know the technologies that can be used to enable these productive use, uses. So what is very important then is to address the adoption and all the barriers that lies, uh, that affects the adoption rates for these technologies. Next. Um, with regards to fecal, uh, yes, to fecal, sorry, still in the wastewater, uh, just want to share some with you some data on the potential for energy and nutrient recovery. So on your right, you see the graph that shows the energy potential in blue. Uh, so the value starting from 2015 and projected for 2030 and 2050. And you see that you have, you know, over 500 billion kilowatt hour of energy potential and more, you know, being aware that this is going to increase um, population growth. Uh, such a huge potential if the energy that is in the wastewater is recovered and is used for different applications. And then on your left, you see another graph that presents this time the potential in nutrient recovery. And I want you to focus on the one in the middle that presents the percent in um, global fertilizer nutrient demand. So if we are to recover the nutrients from the wastewater, uh, then we would have um, 
about 18 percent uh, of the phosphorus you know that can be uh, recovered in this way from the wastewater uh, sorry of the potassium and then for the phosphorus would be about seven percent and finding for the nitrogen would be about 14 percent so there is a real potential for reuse and there it means that we don't have to mine new resources we don't have to uh, to harvest you know them from the from the environment from the natural bodies and the natural systems which is a great opportunity to exploit uh, with regards to the figure slash in the next slide, um, there is also there are a number of opportunities. Also, they're very similar to what we have in the um, uh, in the wastewater. So we can recover the water fraction, the nutrient fraction, and finally the organic matter fraction. And with the organic matter fraction, we can produce, of course, biogas, and it has been uh, alluded earlier by some of my predecessors. But then we can also carbonize this organic matter and produce briquettes, uh, charcoal briquettes, and those briquettes, especially in the developing countries, can substitute conventional charcoal, which is obtained from wood. Uh, so instead of cutting trees uh, to produce this charcoal that is going to be used for cooking, then the alternative is to use the waste and then carbonize the waste and, of course, obtain this charcoal. So this is one of many applications which are currently being implemented in different parts, especially in the developing world. Next. Um, you have another example that shows uh, the next slide, please. Uh, shows another example here uh, with uh, the fecal sludge. So, with the fecal sludge treatment for composting this time, there are also there opportunities uh, to recover the nutrients and provide a number of benefits. So, the treatment plants uh, itself, you know, allows the risk, the health risk, to be controlled. We obtain water that can be used in irrigation, and then the dry material, which is a byproduct from the treatment side, can be co-composted and then used. Uh, you know, after it has been stabilized as an input for agricultural production. Next slide. So this now is to show you some data, you know, in terms of the potential with such a model. So this uh, graph here presents an estimation, you know, of it's very similar to what is happening at the plants. So the baseline greenhouse gas emissions compared to the project emissions. Uh, so it clearly shows that really with the treatment for reuse, we are able to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by two thirds, which is a great, uh, you know, an important achievement, knowing that the baseline in this particular case is just landfilling without any recovery happening. Um, and then, of course, not, this does not include all the other benefits like the nutrients recovery, the water recovery, and all, you know, and this also contributing to climate adaptation uh, for in so enhanced soil productivity and so on. Next slide, please. Yes, so I just want to conclude with uh, some references for you. So the case studies that I presented are available online. Uh, you just go to the website of the International Water Management Institute, iwmi.org, and you have a number of uh, publications that uh, are presenting these case studies that we have compiled and analyzed and sometimes implemented. Uh, and I want to mention that IMI is a part of the CGIAR organization. And uh, let me stop here for today. Thank you very much and happy to take a question during the question sessions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josian. Uh, brilliant presentation. I really love this you know, circular way of thinking and joined up uh, processes, closing the loop. I think uh, linear thinking is you know, kind of a thing of the past. So please yeah, stick around. If we have time, we'll come, come back to you with a question. Um, now, I would uh, like to actually hand over to um, Sylvia again, back at the pavilion, um, to present the final um, case study video, which is around the use of renewable, renewable energies in water supply production and distribution. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you very much, Robin. And definitely, we are going to show how the use of renewable energies in water supply production and distribution are also a great way to contribute to the mitigation agenda. As you know, renewable energy for water services can ensure that the water systems uh, lower emissions, but also can assure that the services are more resilient to climate shocks and to other kind of shocks like political and economic shocks, indeed, as we have seen lately in some of the countries is happening. 
Um, renewable energies can also provide um, electricity to rural areas that are not able to be connected to the grid because it doesn't arrive to this place and can support the livelihoods of local communities. And we have seen um, the case of multiple uses of water um, in previous examples. Um, since 2019, UNICEF, for instance, alone has um, uh, implemented water uh, solar pump systems in more um, than 2,700 um, uh, places um, in more than 50 countries. And this uh, includes major UNICEF um, humanitarian response programs, including Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, and Afghanistan. So um, to address um, the, the need of um, building more capacity to, to get the sector even scaling more up this, because this is only UNICEF contribution, but of course all the other partners are also contribution, contributing equally, um, we need that there is a gap of capacity and, and UNICEF has put in place a regional solar hub for Western Central Africa to improve the capacity on solar uh, and also to strengthen the demand, the market uh, and everything that has to do with solar across the region. Um, not only for water, but also for other sectors. And then, to demonstrate this potential on solar power, we are sharing with you this short video showcasing the use impact of the renewable energy in a refugee camp in Tanzania, a major city in Yemen, and in rural areas of Madagascar. So thank you very much. Increasingly, renewable energy is being used to power critical water and sanitation services in emergencies. In Yeragusu refugee camp in Tanzania, Water Mission uses solar energy to provide water for all the water needs of the camp. Solar energy is used to abstract, treat and distribute water for the camp for all household needs. In such remote locations in Tanzania and elsewhere, where there is low coverage of the national grid, often diesel power generators are used. Converting these to solar or wind can simultaneously reduce emissions as well as lowering the long-term operational costs of water systems. Furthermore, in such remote locations, water services need to be sustainable. The maintenance required for solar-powered systems are lower than generators and do not depend on supplies of fuel, which can be a problem when there are shortages of fuel or price hikes or during extreme events when fuel cannot be collected. For systems which use groundwater, it is important to undertake comprehensive aquifer assessments to ensure that the water resources are sufficient and to install systems to record changes in water levels and quality and to monitor and analyze this data. In Yemen, the water and sanitation infrastructure has been severely damaged, putting enormous pressure on the existing systems, with more than 16 million people in need of safe water across the country. To help provide a reliable and sustainable water service to the most vulnerable, UNICEF, the World Bank and sector partners have been constructing new water systems and repairing and rehabilitating existing ones. In Sana'a, 5,000 solar panels were installed to provide water from 17 water systems, producing more than 6,000 cubic meters of water per day. Without such a reliable supply, Vulnerable families were forced to buy water from private operators at very high prices. And families also need to buy water tanks to store the water, which are very expensive. The use of solar energy to power the water systems ensures that they can provide a reliable water supply without the threat of service interruptions, which can happen due to problems accessing fuel for the diesel-based systems and those depending upon mains electricity. Using solar power for these systems in Sana'a saves almost 1 million liters of fuel per year, greatly reducing greenhouse emissions. <laughs> وال الحمد لله ولا من أول كنا في حالة ما يعلم بها الله الله كنا لا نسر من السبب إن قد تحلني وزارت حنا وايد كان يوصل الله عشر ألف ما بش معانا من النتي ولا ما نقدر نشتري وايدات ولا نقدر لا من السبي الحمد لله والشكر لله الأمور بيضاء خلاص أطمئن أنا تمام يعني من أهم أمور الحياة تجاوزنا الحمد لله والشكر لله ويا ريت يستمر الموضوع بهذا الشكل الحمد لله والشكر لله على كل حال in the south of Madagascar, 
the region regularly suffers from water scarcity, resulting in extended periods of droughts. During this time, traditional water sources often go dry when the water levels fall below the bottom of the well, forcing vulnerable families to travel long distances to collect water. To address this, deep boreholes have been constructed to create multi-use water systems. And these systems have been powered by solar power. Having such access to a reliable water service has enabled families to collect additional water for small-scale irrigation, allowing them to grow vegetables for their families and to sell, creating livelihood opportunities and much-needed household income. Thank you very much for the, that last fantastic uh, case study from UNICEF. So um, we have a few few minutes now left. Um, what I would like to do is I would like to maybe ask to go back to our, um, our panelists and our uh, moderator of the panel discussion to reflect on what has been discussed um, earlier in the panel discussion and also what they've seen through the, the case studies and to perhaps um, share you know, what may be some of their final um, reflections and thoughts for maybe two to, two to three minutes each. Um, could I perhaps invite uh, uh, Professor Jacek to begin with? You're on the screen. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yes. First of all, uh, I'm glad that those case studies, which were prepared independently from our discussion, emphasized uh, the important issues tackled in our roundtable discussion. And we saw energy efficiency, appropriate management, renewable energy sources, uh, nutrient and more general uh, resource recovery. So this, uh, th these issues were uh, tackled in, in, in the case studies and also in our discussion. Secondly, uh, sanitation has played a critical role in improving public health, and this will not change, at least in the nearest future. Uh, therefore, sanitation systems will be expanding anyway in developing countries, and uh, we can see the role of centralized system will be uh, will be increasing. But the new challenges uh, refer to the circular economy. It was strongly emphasized here: uh, circular economy concept, uh, introducing uh, the closed loop. Uh, well, in a, in extremely. Uh, case uh, the closed loop in urban areas and also sustainability and this is good that improved sanitation can, can go hand in hand with climate mitigation thank you thank you very much um, professor can i now invite uh, sarah to say a few words in two to three minutes mm -hmm. thank you um, thank you. So yeah, these were very interesting uh, case studies. Um, I think, uh, first of all, it's important to think about the big picture. Many other sectors are contributing to larger emissions. Um, so for sanitation so far, it has been relatively small, but at the same time, uh, the trend is increasing. Emissions will uh, grow as more households get on the sanitation ladder, and in many cases also in urban areas when there are more centralized wastewater treatment systems being implemented. Um, so uh, maybe there, it's been hard to make a good argument, but um, I think that addressing poorly managed sanitation systems um, is a perfect example of a solution with many co-benefits. And I think we heard about many of those co-benefits in the case studies. Um, so there are benefits in terms of climate mitigation and reducing emissions from these systems, particularly from the management of these systems. Um, um, uh, but also we can also contribute to um, reducing environmental damage, damage to ecosystems, um, to human health, um, and produce a number of uh, benefits that we heard of in terms of um, fertilizers or energy um, and so on. Um, so I think we have an opportunity now um, when we're looking at the, the major sanitation challenge that we have, the gap in sanitation access. Um, we need to think about the choices that we are making today to meet those needs and how um, they can contribute to a more sustainable future through climate action. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. 
And uh, finally, from uh, the moderator, uh, Dr. Gabor. Over to you, Gabor. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks. Thanks for the uh, for the confirmation. <clears throat> so I was very happy that uh, um, our points uh, resonated also uh, very well um, in the in the case studies. I was I was uh, very happy to see them. Um, with a notable uh, 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 underlining of, for example, non-revenue uh, uh, water losses and how they are being treated. I believe that that was a UNICEF Ukraine uh, uh, case. I basically have uh, six um, points uh, and these are not fully related to the case studies. These are more the issues that I feel that uh, they also need to be added to our long list of, of challenges and, and, and how we may be able to approach uh, uh, aligning well with uh, climate change mitigation. So the first thing that, that I realized today, perhaps more than before, is that despite that uh, climate change mitigation seems much further from us than uh, adaptation issues, it, it is something that should be strongly integrated, uh, strategically integrated in our, into our uh, uh, system design considerations. Uh, what I believe from experience we also need is a more accelerated transition to sustainable and also inclusive for poor water sanitation and solid waste services. That was also reflected in uh, uh, some of the case studies. Um, for that, I'm convinced that we need to attract capable partners from within our sectors. So from the reduction of non-revenue water to the um, uh, um, increased access uh, to potential financing, we need to partner up with the relevant specialists to strengthen our implementation processes, to make them quicker, to make them more robust. Um, I also believe that we have talked a lot about uh, closing the loop, nutrient efficiency, energy efficiency. Um, treated effluent has not uh, been that, uh, that uh, uh, um, present in the discussion, but it also belongs here, of course. When we are talking about closing the loop, it does offer good opportunities for strategical partnerships in the agricultural sector, in the energy sector, or perhaps even in other parts of the industry. Um, if we want to make a, a proper transition to, uh, improved, uh, to some improvements in climate mitigation, then financing may be a key. So if we are talking about financing, we need better narratives. We learned that before. And I also would like to add, we also need to reduce our operational risks to attract uh, um, green funds and financiers and uh, specific climate financing options. Um, as my fifth point, uh, I would like to mention that perhaps more than, than anything, this, this innovative character of our sector is, is uh, relevant today. So we need uh, um, to reduce the distance and we need to increase the rate uh, of coming from a scientific or an innovation idea to actual implementation and upscaling. So we need to align our systems to make sure that good ideas can, uh, can accelerate into um, actual proved concepts and upscaled solutions. And finally, I'd like to remind all of you that uh, our sector of contribution uh, in the face of uh, uh, climate change, but also um, migration and urbanization, the challenges are very, very complex. So when you're talking about a dynamically changing environment around us, what is perhaps our best tool to ensure those changes is our own capacity to learn and our own uh, dedication to share uh, and exchange ideas. So if we keep doing that, then I believe that our sector is ready even for this uh, huge challenge. Thank you for your attention. Um, over to Robin, please. Thank you to all of our panelists and uh, moderator Gabor for those inspiring words to, for, to take home from uh, this day. Um, this, that's it for the, uh, this mitigation session. I think before handing back over to the pavilion, I would just like to say yeah, thank you to all of the, the speakers, the co-conveners uh, involved in this session. Um, Gabor, Sarah, Jacek, uh, Josiane, Arta, and Sylvia herself back at the pavilion. So um, I think this has been a very fascinating, interesting session. And let's uh, hope this con uh, discussion continues um, and gets the attention that it, it deserves. So thank you very much again. And over to you, Sylvia, at the pavilion. Climate change poses one of the greatest threats to our future, and it is inextricably linked to water. 
Water scarcity, droughts, cyclones, and other natural disasters threaten our water supply and have a direct impact on children's lives. Although the water and sanitation sector has not benefited from large-scale climate funds to date, the sector offers enormous opportunities to contribute to both climate change mitigation and adaptation efforts. Climate resilient wash services are more sustainable, strengthen community resilience to climate change and natural disasters, generate employment and livelihood opportunities, and reduce the risks of conflict and migration. The wash sector can help lower carbon emissions through the use of renewable energy and more efficient systems. In Ukraine, hydraulic modeling of the water network improves water and energy efficiency by identifying sections with leaks. Replacing them not only saves water, but also reduces the costs of operating the systems and lowers greenhouse gas emissions. The wash sector can contribute to mitigation by reducing emissions through the use of solar-powered wastewater treatment. In Jordan, an innovative approach uses solar power to treat wastewater from mosques and schools, which is then reused for irrigation. This saves scarce water resources and provides excess solar power for income generating activities. The opportunities presented by WASH to ensure the resilience of communities are enormous and continue to increase. In Mozambique, replacing shallow hand pumps with solar powered systems allowed communities to access water even during droughts. When Cyclone Edai struck, it destroyed homes, schools, and clinics, leaving hundreds of thousands of people homeless. But the water systems continue to operate, providing life-saving water to communities without the need for costly emergency water supplies. In areas most hit by water scarcity in Madagascar, water systems were constructed to provide water for domestic use as well as small-scale irrigation systems. This has allowed families to grow crops and to have convenient access to water without having to walk long distances. This has the added benefit of providing nutritious food for children and generating income for very vulnerable households. In Bangladesh, surface water and rainwater collected from rooftops is collected and filtered and then injected into the saline aquifer. This creates a freshwater bubble providing fresh water and protecting the aquifer from pollution and storm surges. The water is then collected by the community through a hand pump during the dry season or extreme climatic events. In the face of the rapidly intensifying climate crisis, we must collectively work together to ensure everyone has access to a climate resilient water and sanitation service. By doing so, the WASH sector increases the resilience of vulnerable communities while simultaneously reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It also accelerates social and economic development, creating sustainable livelihood opportunities and critical skills for young people, making this world a better place for present and future generations. over to me. Um, hi, I'm Kelly Ann Naylor um, and I'm UNICEF's Director for Water Sanitation, Hygiene, Climate, Environment, Energy and Disaster Risk Reduction. And um, I think this last video just really kind of summed up um, what a great day it's been. And Excellencies, distinguished participants, thank you so much for being here and really listening to to today's session. I think there's no uncertainty that water and sanitation sector is a critical part of the future of the climate action movement. And I think today's Water Pavilion program has been just entirely dedicated to talking about climate resilient water and sanitation. We've looked at it from the angles of adaptation, mitigation, financing, policy, advocacy, and monitoring. It's really been 
a full 360. Um, I think it's fitting that this session is really coming um, midstream of the COP conference, um, where we're looking at both bridging this traditional focus on mitigation with really a big bang to strengthen and accelerate the efforts on adaptation. Um, and we're also looking at how this work on climate action is also part of also accelerating um, the, the progress on the sustainable development goals, um, particularly in this context of um, SDG 6. Um, it, it, it's important to contextualize this, and, and I think we've heard this week that LDCs and African countries have really emphasized that, that most of the discussions have focused on mitigation, but that the most vulnerable groups are going to need to adapt to the impact of climate change. And certainly over the course of, of today, um, I joined at 5 a.m., um, and we're now uh, approaching 1 p.m., um, we've really heard um, a pathway that what Water and sanitation can be part of the solution to close this gap and really break this false dichotomy by pr proposing practical proven solutions that contribute to both the mitigation and adaptation as well as the overall social and economic development of the most vulnerable countries and populations that are also so um, highly effective as we've heard um, throughout today by different changes um, in, in climate. So I I think we can feel um, optimistic that um that we are really together in this journey. And you know, we've had today um, partners and examples from over 20 countries um, that really are already showing tangible progress being made around the world and um, really want to give another round of applause for the incredible experiences that you are all leading uh, globally, regionally, in countries and cities and communities um, around the world. So given the rich discussion we've had today, it's a very daunting task to even begin to summarize it, um, but just wanted to recap a few key messages and really cross-cutting themes that I heard coming out across today's session. Um, I think early on and, and throughout the day, we heard um, about the need to be breaking silos, um, silos between water sanitation and hygiene, which many of us call WASH, um, with water resources and climate. Um, we heard this in the, the session this morning on adaptation um, in the partnership section that we must be working with better alignment across the whole of SDG 6 and with other sectors. And I think we really came to the conclusion that as an international community, we must make greater efforts to be able to work better together and provide this more integrated support to governments to help consolidate their political will around a common agenda for action. Another um, area that we heard of coming, uh, that we heard coming up a number of times and, and very much in this last session on mitigation um, was around the need for solutions that are circular. And by this, we really discussed um, the need for more integrated solutions that can close the loop, that can tackle the climate change challenge, but also realize the full benefits for water and sanitation services, service providers, um, and ultimately, um, um, users. And so we, we, we've seen that this needs to be done through more engagement between sectors. We saw some really exciting um, in important synergies with other sectors that rely on water, like agriculture, energy sectors, um, but also through um, addressing pollution prevention through safely managed sanitation and solid waste management. Um, we've seen how this is important for both sides of the equation of mitigation and adaptation and we've seen some really concrete examples, whether it's energy efficiency of water supply, reducing greenhouse gases through safely managed sanitation, or um, looking at value chains and the sanitation um, circular economy or using renewable energies and water supply production and distribution. A third key area that I think came up in every session was on financing. And this is certainly a key puzzle piece. And we had a whole segment um, dedicated to this as well as, as, as seeing how it, it came across. Um, earlier in this week, many of us saw the adaptation gap report, which really highlighted that LDCs are gonna need to spend up to 10 times more on climate adaptation. Um, we've also heard in the, in the, in the WASH side and in the water 
broader side of the SDG 6 progress uh, reports that we're going to need to be able to quadruple our current rates of progress. Um, so really looking at um, at this financing equation, we're looking at solutions that are not necessarily more expensive, but we do need to be unlocking the funding sources to take them to scale. Um, I think we've seen that partnerships is going to be a fundamental part of the financing equation. We saw some excellent examples on government-led and business-led um, uh, ways that we are coming together to lead successful and innovative financing experiences to bring additional investment into climate resilient water and sanitation solutions. I think we also heard um, coming from voices of private sector, we need that predictable policy and enabling environment. And we also need to really make sure we're getting money where it's needed. And this is both to address the lack of services, but also reduce the, the adverse impacts of climate change. A fourth message I heard was that um, innovations and research um, can be an accelerator of progress, and certainly they can help us um, to better tailor our solutions. I think we've seen um, that we've been able to better understand um, new areas like the contribution of sanitation to global emissions, wash energy neutrality, um, that can all be ways that we can do more with less um, and accelerate progress. But we also heard that we need to focus on the implementation of research and innovation to make sure that we get these into the hands of those who need them most for context-specific solutions, viable business models, and actual implementation. Midway um, through today's program, we heard from the Minister of Malawi, who so uh, eloquently reminded us that water is life and that we have to focus on the most vulnerable. And I picked this background because I thought it was so important to give a human face um, to this task that we have. I want, we can call it a crisis, we can call it an opportunity, but we cannot forget that water and sanitation are human rights and are essential basic services. Um, and that, and that there is an injustice that those with the lowest water and sanitation service levels are often the, the ones who are also more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And we must work towards a more um, equal society and, and, and eliminate these inequalities. Um, that we do think that limit that linking water and sanitation are essential for leaving no one behind. And this came up again and again throughout the day. Um, two final ones. One is we must track our progress. And I think to be able to say the impact that we're having, it's evident that we need to be able to measure whether drinking water supplies and sanitation services are resilient to the future impacts of climate change. We heard in the second session, um, Guy presented a framework that can be used to measure whether the services um, are resilient to the future impacts of climate change um, and how this can be used in making decisions. We've, we've heard we must be doing this monitoring for action, um, but we've also heard that there's an importance. We need these metrics for the private sector to be able to measure their contributions across business performance, supply chains, and how this is benefiting communities. Um, and the last point is we've heard, um, and most of all from countries today, um, the importance of really showcasing how important it is that adaptation needs um, are for formalized and being um, well integrated into the national priorities set out in the nationally determined contributions and the national adaptations plans. And we heard these success stories coming from Malawi, pa Pakistan, Cabo Verde, and many other countries. But still today, only five of the 46 LDCs have submitted their NAPs. So we have this opportunity now going forward to use the, the preparation of these maps to really help us walk the talk to make sure that wash and water resources are very well integrated from the start. So dear climate resilient wash champions, those of you who are here in the water pavilion or there in the water pavilion and those of us who are joining the conversation from locations around the world, today has really been a groundbreaking discussion. Um, on behalf of UNICEF and the session organizers, I'd like to close by thanking all of the partners who contributed to this first ever Climate Resilient Wash Day, to the organizers for the first ever 
Water Pavilion at COP, um, and to all of you who are doing such incredible work around the world to make climate resilient water and sanitation services um, a reality for millions and billions of people around the world. Um, it's an understatement to say that time is of the essence and that the stakes are high. Um, and thinking about a future without climate resilient water and sanitation services is, is unconscionable. Young people are making their voices clear that this climate crisis is a child rights crisis and that their futures are at stake um, and that more action is needed now and to build this better future. So on the bright side, we've heard this call and we are part of the international community that are stepping up to this challenge as the water and sanitation sector. We're doing this through our action on the sustainable development goals. We're doing this through our climate action and these two things are coming together in a way that we can um, make this a reality. So we must join these forces together, the marriage of water and sanitation and climate action. And I'd like us to set a goal for ourselves of one year from today, the 6th November, to come back together with even more results, even more progress, even more partnership, and even more greater resources for our work that will translate this global um, commitment of support and collaboration into concrete results for country, people, and children around the world. This climate crisis does have a human face. So let's do this for our planet, for our people, and for every child. So thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure to, um, to be here today, to listen to everything that has been shared, um, and just wish you all best um, wishes for a continued successful COP program um, at the Water Pavilion and looking forward to continue this journey together. So thank you so much and uh, wishing you a, a great day.